How about that? Yeah, it worked. Oh, I guess there's a storm going through, so that was the problem. But we tried a bunch of different combinations of my phone and Jill's phone. And so it's working now. All right, I'll just plug my stuff in here. And I'm not going to need this shirt because I'm inside now and it's kind of muggy in here. Kind of a hot day today. And a lot of storms go through. Um, we had a storm last night about 10 o'clock, got about an inch. And then today we had another one, pretty good one too, that came through right about lunchtime. Head part was really whipping. All right. Well, tonight is Wednesday night and it is our traditional question and answer. Uh, and, and uh, Uh, this is where this all begins than that, and glad to do it. Um, things are good. What I did today that was kind of exciting was I, I'm needing to build some new chicken tractors. And the ones that we've been using were built a long time ago, like, like 10 years ago, and we're still using some of them. And all this time uh, of operating those, chicken tractors i've thought there's a better way uh, it's a combination of materials that are readily available and uh, it should go together quicker i thought and it should be easier to operate so it should be lighter to move and still maintain relatively the same profile because the profile that we use when we get high winds um, it just pulls them right down to the ground we've never had one actually endo or uh, go anywhere except for one time we had a lot of them just picked up, moved about three feet and set back down. And, uh, you know, if we hadn't have noticed the different positioning, we would have ne never even known that had happened, but it pushed it back where they were. So uh, the, the uh, design that we use right now is good. I just thought that there was a better one out there. So today was the day <clears throat> that we actually got the materials uh, and started working on it and uh, got it to the point where I was about to start wrapping the chicken wire around it and then, uh, you know, had to break off for this. But that's okay because I needed to eat and that's okay. It's, it's kind of windy outside. Plus, my son needed to, James P., thank you, Marines, ooh, ooh rah. My son needed to use the bay to put a glass pack on his buddy's truck. Of course. What's the first thing you do when you buy a used truck and you're 16? You cut the muffler off and then put on a muffler so uh, a glass pack so it'll have that really rumbly sound. You know, everybody will know you're coming, right? Cool. I did that too. I don't know what it is <clears throat> about youth. All right, so uh, this week we've been kind of discussing a little bit uh, animals and the homestead. But, you know, Wednesday night, you guys can ask anything that you want. I do have the lovely Miss Jill right here by my side on the laptop. So she kind of moderates the conversation and all that good stuff. And... Uh, I would like to take care of a little house cleaning here. Uh, we got a good, pretty good group in here. Um, our class for this fall, anyone can, anyone can farm homestead hog harvest is full, is full. Um, but it, it's, it's full, it's filled up very early. Usually we are not filled up until we get very close to that. So that tells me that um, the interest is there for the homestead hog harvest. And if people would like to get on the list, if we get another 12 people that sign up, we'll have two classes. We'll open up another weekend. If you live in Maine and you were going to travel out here, uh, there is going to be a class in Maine. And that's going to be in October. 
Um, if that's any interest to you, uh, get a hold of us and we'll fill you in on the details. Or you can get a hold of Joe Brown at uh, um, Long Shot Revival Homestead. He's going to be hosting. Um, along those lines, if you're in Maine, you can get a hold of Mofka, and that's Maine Organic Farmers Farmers and Growers Association, Mofka. And inquire with them about it because my understanding is that they have grants available for veterans, veterans or veterans, whatever, however you like to pronounce that. And uh, the guy that you're going to want to talk to there is Bo. His name is Bo, B-O. And I've, I've spoken with them and uh, they've got lots of opportunities for vets. So um, you may be able to come to the class out there, Joe Brown's and uh, Mofka may pay for it. I'm not sure. We'll have, you'll have to see. Talk to Bo at Mofka. <clears throat> or Joe Brown. Talk to Joe Brown at Long Shot Revival Homestead. Um, the other class is going to be in Bath, New Hampshire. That's a little shaky right now. Um, there's a lot of things riding on it. New England isn't really recovered from uh, the China virus. It's funny. Um, I... I've talked to people that have uh, traveled in the South and it's like, you know, a lot of places that you go in the South, you wouldn't even know that it even happened here in Michigan. We're one of the five States that, you know, 62% of the uh, deaths occurred in five States. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but they made a big deal out of it here and they still are kind of pushing it. But I understand the narrative has just totally fallen apart because with the riots, uh, peaceful protests, I mean, um, you didn't have the cops coming out and breaking people up because they were not social distancing or not wearing their little face coverings. Uh, but if, if the COVID was so bad that 14 days, we should see a real spike. And I guess today was day 14, no spike. So that means it's not as catchy as they said, which I feel kind of indicated because I never thought it was. But I, as I said, the heavy hand of government and um, in some states, you know, you have some real uh, retards that are running the show. Oh, sorry. Mental cases, I mean. And, you know, that's the problem. And Michigan is one of the five states. I guess it's Michigan. Uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, and New Jersey. Go figure. Just go figure. Can you believe that? And there, a lot of them are still locked down. And, you know, their economies are even worse, ruined even worse than, uh, than quite a few of the other states. So, good. Um, The let's see. The other thing is I do have some pigs for sale. I have some breeding stock. And if I don't get them moved by this week, um, we are just going to castrate them and I'm just going to feed them out here. I kept some back for breeding stock for people. Uh, I am recommending that you get into a little bit of a sustainable operation. Uh, if you're going to, if you can produce, 15 or 20 uh, wiener pigs a year, you could be a hot commodity, you know, as I have been. So, you know, I've got this breeding stock and I would really love to sell them. We're offering them pretty cheap. Um, you'll have to contact me for that. I put a picture of them up on the tribe and I got a lot of contacts, right? But we are not giving them away. That's not how it works. It wouldn't be a viable uh, business if I had to give them away to you. You wouldn't want them, right? But I, I think people thought that we were just going to, I said rehome, you know, because on Facebook you can't say for sale. And I think a lot of people thought that, oh, we're just giving them away. Why Why would I give them away? I mean, any, nothing that we do here do we just give away. Everything has value. Um, except for this. I guess I give this away. Uh, let's see. We had puppies. Uh, so last night we talked about 
predation and uh, wild animals and pets and things like that as pertains to your livestock operation on your homestead. And I was able to say, hey, we use great Pyrenees dogs and I happen to have some. We have had a, uh, a litter several days ago and I, you probably hear them in there uh, crying. <laughs> so that's that. That's our, our homestead um, house cleaning for this evening. Uh, do, Mom, do we have any leftover questions that I need to dive into or are there any questions for this week? You want to play stump the dummy? All right, we can just we can just knock it off early. Um, got 27 people. Oh, how about everybody going over and subscribing on Baker's Green Acres YouTube? How about that? And give us a thumbs up. Yeah. 27 people there. If we had we got 15 thumbs up, let's see if we can get 27 thumbs up. I'll put that link in one moment. Okay. The link to what? The tribe page. The tribe page. All right. And the tribe, we're way up over 800. So that's really good. Um, the tribe is a Facebook page and it's the Anyone Can Farm tribe page. And uh, the purpose of that is we can do things over there that are not uh, advertiser friendly and, uh, so long as Facebook knows that we're doing that, they don't care. But uh, if we put any question, what they consider questionable uh, processes up and anything having to do with processing animals or even, even some of the things we talk about, they don't like that or they don't like to make that available to their advertisers. So on the tribe page, we can kind of do what we want. Uh, human sacrifice, you name it, and nobody really cares. But the tribe, you have to apply to get in, and we, you know, we send all your information to the Federal Bureau of Information of uh, Investigation. They do a thorough vetting on you, and then I hit the uh, accept button, and you're in, right? But we can throw you out just as quick if if you don't like that stuff, then you know don't don't join. Um, we haven't really. I don't think we've thrown anybody out. We've had people that have quit because they didn't like us talking about the China virus. Uh, so anyway, that's too bad. I don't think I have thrown anybody actually out. No. No, this is kind of a group of people that, uh, you know, usually doers and people that, that get entertained by farm things. They're usually pretty steady people. Steady and sober people. So if there are questions tonight, if you'll please put them in caps. Um, and then Jill will know it's a question. Um, you know, one thing that came up as I've been talking to people this week for chicken processing, getting them scheduled in, yeah. um, is keeping chickens cool when it's really hot so that they keep growing. Okay. How do you do that? How do you keep them growing in yeah. the weather? Uh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, and, and this would pertain to, even if you weren't doing your chickens out on pasture, um, we are big time pastured poultry type folks. And there's usually here in Northern Michigan, there's usually a, uh, a week or two when it's really hot. And that here is when it gets to be like 90 and you know it's really humid and uh that can be very difficult on full-grown uh cornish cross chickens usually those are the chickens that people use for broilers for meat chickens it can be really tough on them and uh we've lost more birds to heat than anything else and we've had some real train wrecks when it comes to that um what you can do if it's a really really hot day uh i've seen some designs of chicken tractors that people have made and some of the designs are down south and i i want to say something to them but i'm not going to stick my nose into what people are doing uh like that i'm, I'm just not going to um 
unless I have a, a kind of a relationship with these people where I can call them offline and say, hey, you're getting ready to do something really dumb there. Uh, but if I don't have that relationship with them, I'm not going to I'm not going to say anything. But when you build your chicken tractor, you want to leave it open all the way around. So that means do not bring the sides down all the way to the bottom. Don't do that. Leave about this much space so it'll just be chicken wire. And you can even leave more space than that. You know, all you really need is a roof over them so they don't get wet when it rains and um, they're not sitting in the blazing sun. That's what the roof is there for. It's not to keep them warm. Right. Chickens, by the time you put them out in a chicken tractor, they should be fully feathered out and cold is not going to be their problem. We've had chickens out and gotten four inches of snow on top of the chicken tractors. Never had a problem. But but there again, you know, I mean, they had a roof over them. So when the snow came down, it got hung up on the roof and we just pushed it off. And usually when it snows in the spring, it's gone really quickly did that happen this year i seem to remember we did we had snow this spring but i don't know if we had chickens yeah. out were they out um, they're in the brooder they're still in the brooder yeah we just missed it we yeah. held them off actually because we knew it was coming but uh you you get a really hot day and the birds when they get distressed all right let's say they get really hot they will pile they will cluster up and they will pile and uh, what you have to do is you have to uh, figure out a way to get some airflow over them if you want to save them. And, you know, it's kind of tough if they're out on the field and, you know, maybe you could move <clears throat> a big fan out there or something like that. But like for us, that wouldn't work if we have a line of chicken tractors. So what I did was I went out there with our pressure washer and I stood off from them um, in the direction that there was a slight breeze going their direction and I stood off from them probably 15 feet and just back and forth and it made a mist and that mist started rolling in their direction and it started to accelerate the air going across them and I just did that and uh we, we knew we had a problem because when chickens get really hot like that, they'll prostrate themselves out on the ground and then they're just panting really hard. And a lot of times once they get to that point, it's over. You know, it's pretty hard to bring them back. Um, <clears throat> but that did work. That did work. Uh, actually, last week, uh, last Friday, Someone dropped off birds here and it was a really, it was really hot. And they rode them here in the back of a pickup in a cage, two cages actually. And uh, then they unloaded them and put them right in the sun. And uh, I happened to be walking by and, you know, one of my kids was helping them unload it. And it was one of the younger children and they didn't, they didn't really notice what was going on but when i walked by those chickens were all laid out and the necks were out and they were panting hard but they were they were young chickens these people wanted i guess cornish uh cornish hens is what they wanted they wanted small ones so i immediately moved them into the shade and uh you know got the hose out and just I didn't, you know, I didn't soak them, but I did, you know, uh, get them going and cooled it off all around them, cooled the air off around them. And uh, in an hour or so, they were up again and they were okay and we didn't have a problem. So um, what we ask people to do that are bringing chickens to us on chicken processing days, if it's a hot day, bring them late, bring them after dark. Uh, one time we, we've had a couple of horror shows here for other people. One time I was cutting hay at the neighbors and about three o'clock in the afternoon, I see this, this guy coming down. I can see he's got chicken tractors or chicken, uh, cages 
in his pickup with a, a, uh, a topper on the pickup, a dark colored topper, all closed up. Didn't want the wind to get at him, I guess. And uh, when I got home, uh, we moved them all into the basement of the barn where it was cool. The next day, the majority of them were dead. <coughs> it was a terrible thing. But there was really nothing we could do. He totally stressed them out bringing them over here. And they were big, fat things, too. Um, another time, the youth show, the Masaki County Youth Show, uh, we had agreed to do their turkeys. They brought them here while we were gone. And they dropped them right in the driveway in the full sun at, like, noon. And... and we pulled in like maybe four o'clock, dead. <laughs> like 15 of them, all dead. 15 or 20, all dead. Our relationship wasn't good with them for a couple of years until whoever they whoever did that left. All right. Well enough. Do we need lights in here, Mom? There we go. Uh, what about laying hens? How do I keep my chickens laying? They've stopped in the last few weeks. Because it's hot. Um, I don't know as the strategy is to keep them laying. I don't think that is the strategy. Through the summer, you kind of want to keep them laying, though. Uh, yeah, but when they quit laying, I think the first thing we think of is what means can I employ to get them to start laying again? Uh, so in the wintertime, they quit laying. Oh, I'll put a heater in there and I'll heat that place up. Or I'll put lights in there so they'll start laying again. I'm not sure if that's the way that – that's not the way I want to go anymore. We used to kind of play that thing because you have these this group of chickens that you're you're – given feed to all winter long and they're not giving you any eggs. Um, chickens go through times when they just don't ovulate, you know, they just don't put eggs down and it can be when it's too hot or too cold or not enough light or what, what else stops them from extreme stress? Yeah. Extreme. Yeah. If you move them, yeah. Heat stress. Um... So usually what you're you're looking at with a laying flock is kind of feast or famine. Uh, so you'll see people with signs out in front of their houses. Eggs, you know, 50 cents a dozen because they have tons of them. You know, you might have 50 chickens and they're all giving you an egg a day. And that adds up really quick. But then they stop and then you have none. And I, Americans don't really understand eggs very well. And that's understandable that you don't understand eggs. You're, you're not supposed to understand eggs. That's, that's kind of the program. Um, my wife's aunt uh, told us that all uh, through her upbringing, the eggs went, what, on the back stoop. And it was on the north side of their house and it was cool. Even in the summertime, it was cool there. So they would put the eggs back there and they never refrigerated them. Um, the eggs are in a hermetically sealed um, container and they're, they're fine. What happens to eggs is they, uh, the fluid that's on the inside of them um, comes through the shell and then you start getting this pocket inside of there of air because when the fluids come through, it has to be replaced with something. And so air goes in. How does this happen? Right? Well, this happens on commercial eggs because the brainiacs um, in academia uh, believe that you've got to wash the egg, right? And when you wash the egg, what happens? There's a protective coating on there. It's kind of a waxy coating. Uh, it comes from the chicken, and that waxy coating enhances the seal of the, the, 
the egg, the eggshell. It enhances that. Uh, eggs sitting on the counter are good for 100 days anyway. And then when you open them, they're probably going to be good for another 100 days. What, what are you hearing? Something? Oh. So if you start to understand eggs a little better, there's a way to preserve those eggs even further than that 100 days. Um, when you, you know, when you get eggs from the store and you hard boil them and you open them up and there's this big indent, indent on the top of them, there's this big gap. That's because uh, they've washed the eggs and a lot of the fluid that's on the inside has evaporated out of the egg. Uh, on eggs that are not washed, we don't wash our eggs. I mean, if there's a little bit of crust on there, you just kind of push it off with your with your hands. If it's really gross, you just put it under cold water and just use just your hand. You don't use any any soap or anything because that'll break the protective cut crust that's on there. And uh, you know, what chicken manure is not poison not going to kill you. As a matter of fact, these days it'd probably be good for you to have a little bit of chicken manure once in a while. And even if you think you got it all off, you didn't get it all off. So it's not going to kill you. It's natural. I know I'd get, catch a lot of flack on that one, but that's, that's the reality of it. Even if you think that egg is clean, it's got some manure on it or something, you know, some nest material or some dirt or something. You know, this is a kind of a controversial thing to say. Um, we knew a processor south of us, and he's passed away now. Um, but I knew somebody that worked for him. And his philosophy, he was, he was, he was pretty up there, you know. So he would have been 80 when he died. Uh, his philosophy was cleanliness is overrated. That was his philosophy. And I was new getting into the processing business, and I was, like, appalled by that. Just appalled. But now that I've been through all the instruction from the intelligentsia, um, it is overrated. Because you think you're getting the stuff clean, but you're really not getting the stuff clean. I mean, it, it, on a mic, microscopic level, things don't change all that much just because you put a little Dawn dish soap on it. So, I don't know. I think cleanliness, in a way, is overrated. It's a tough thing to say, but, um, you know, washing down your counters with Clorox all the time, I don't think is the smartest thing to do because you just weaken your own immune system. We're finding that out now. So, Jill has... a. Uh, a video that's on Baker's Green Acres YouTube, and it's called Water Glassing Eggs, and I recommend that you go and watch that. It's pretty good. And we are uh, using eggs now that uh, they're a year old, aren't they? Uh, or are we now. not using them now? I'm okay. not using them. We're no, using the ones now. Eggs, yeah. Okay. But yeah. I had year and a half old eggs. I did a video on that. Yeah. So. And they're fine. But there's a way to do that that you – completely do away with the ability of the egg to um, give off any of its fluid through, you know, it's a process called osmosis and you can, you can just stop that dead in its tracks and those eggs will be preserved for a long, long time. The key to that is not bouncing them around too much and, and breaking the uh, shells. Okay. It's getting a little chilly in here actually. Mm -hmm that window open yeah. be good sleeping with it at night another way to help the chickens handle the heat is uh a little we've done this before too vitamin electrolyte in their water yeah um because it keeps them from being as stressed so the meat birds will keep eating and the layers keep laying when it gets really hot yeah and i've heard of people giving their uh laying hens ice water just putting some ice cubes in their water hmm. to keep them cool. We've never had problems with our laying hens because no. of heat. No, we <clears> haven't. But... Far more durable than a meat bird. <laughs> I've just heard of that. Hmm. But you also have it set up so that they can roost outside at night. Yeah. So then they really cool off at night well, and it's protected from the rain. But... Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, Brittany uh, had this question. Someone uh, asked her about flushing her sows. If I flush my sows, what does that mean? Yeah, flushing your sows means uh, when they're about to ovulate, when they're when they're le leading up to ovulation, you want to give them. This is theory, anyway. You want to give them as much um, energy as as they can eat, and hopefully they will drop far more eggs, and you know you'll get more more embryos. That's what's flushing the sow is. Uh, I think it's kind of a, a factory um, farming tool. I don't think it's something that you're going to be too concerned with. Uh, your payback would, I don't know, you could try it. I, we don't do it uh, because of the, the method that we use. We're using like the sounder method. So, you know, I, I have different age groups together and they're at different stages of gestation. So it really wouldn't work for me. Uh, when you have your sows in gestation crates and you know, okay, she is going to be birth. So 30 days prior, I want to give her some really high energy food. So she's going to have more piglets to set up. I don't, if you only had one sow or two sows, you could. But let's say you have one sow and they're they're thirty days out, or two two sows that are thirty days difference. You know, unless you have them in separate pens, it's kind of difficult to to do it. That's my thought on it. Alrighty, Cody B. <laughs> Cody B. Brittany's going to be having a baby soon, isn't she? Uh, a month yet, maybe. Okay. Um, do you think a whole corn, bean meal, and mineral pack mix is healthier than hog chop? Oh, yeah. If it's just a mineral pack, if there's... make sure that there's no raw protein in there raw protein and bean uh, that's not raw protein a mineral pack would be um, that's not raw protein in there. you know a mineral pack is 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 minerals right and when you buy mineral uh, a bag of mineral or a uh, boy the lights are flickering yeah. It's pretty windy outside. We might lose power. If we lose power, maybe we'll be able to stay on. I don't know. Um, and the mineral pack's not going to hurt. And, you know, you you can buy mineral. We buy mineral. And it it's, it's sort of, it looks like cement, actually. Um, but it's got salts and stuff like that. And for the cows, we get mineral blocks. And then the cows lick it and bite it and all that. Um, but that's way better than hog chow. Way better than hog chow. Don't do hog chow. If you do hog chow, be ready for having to do a lot of other things too. But if you can keep your herd healthy, um, keep the hog chow away from them and they will stay healthy. Okay. Okay. Because that raw protein, remember, that is everything that they couldn't fit in a spam can. And do you know what spam is? Spam is like canned meat and, you know, pig buttholes or eyelids or anything else. But whatever they can't put in a spam can, they dry it, pulverize it, make a powder out of it. 
And then that goes in hog chow again. And that's legit. That's according to the USDA, that's legitimate. And so when you feed hog chow and you have that horrible, horrible smell, that's from, that's what that's from. If you don't feed hog chow, you won't have that horrible smell and you'll be okay. So there you go. All right. Yeah, Haven said they went to a factory farm pig operation a while back, and it was pretty traumatizing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I when I first got out of the service, I <clears throat> I was helping a guy with the maintenance on his semi. It was a guy that lived around here, and he <clears throat> he had a uh, a livestock trailer, and he would drive down and he would pick up loads of pigs and then take them down to Indiana to be processed. And, uh, he had asked me if I would like to start driving for him. And I thought, yeah, why not? You know, I'll be the mechanic operator There's a vehicle out there. And, uh, so I made one trip, went to a confinement operation down in Barrington, picked up a load of hogs. Are you cool? Cool. Why are you shut up? Okay. But I went in that hog house, and I think there were 500 uh, pigs in there, because I think that's what the semi would hold. And just that many beings in that small, confined area, and they'd been in there, and just the, the closeness of the, of the air in there, and... Uh, you know, when I would touch the pigs, they were, they were wet and I didn't like it at all. And then I, I drove the semi down into Indiana, backed it in where it was supposed to go. Didn't do a very good job of it. And, uh, there was a bunch of people that came out. None of them spoke English and they drove all of those pigs off the semi and about 10 of them were too weak to get off the semi. Um, and there's no reason why they should have been weak. It was not cold out. It was not hot out. It was just they were, they're very not very durable animals. I mean, they're they're kept in a in a uh, confinement barn, and all they do is get up, eat, drink, poop, pee, lay down. That's all they do. They don't dig. They don't do any of that stuff. So they're kind of like couch potatoes, and they have no durability. And uh, really bad. I didn't want to do it. I made one trip and I said, no, that's not for me. So that was when I decided. And at the time, actually, um, this guy that owned the semi was like, hey, I'm thinking about putting hog houses in on my place. Yeah, this this outfit that I'm hauling pigs for, they say you can do pretty good with these things. And I actually considered it. I considered it enough to where we did a site survey here, dedicated some dollars to it. Glad I didn't go that route. That's Claire barking. She's off her nest. Okay. You got any other questions for me? We got a yeah, lot of people in. I'm surprised we don't have more questions. Yeah, it's pretty quiet in the question department. Yeah, all right. Um, Cody, how early do gilts normally start breeding? That's a good question. We've had some really young ones that we didn't think were uh, going to breed. And all of a sudden, <laughs> they were pregnant. And that's why we, uh, we know about litter mates breeding. Um, that happens. And, you know, I... I would say that when that happened, she was probably about six months old, so not very old. We know that boars can breed uh, probably a couple months younger than sows can take, and a lot of times they'll be playing around, but you'll think, well, they're not old enough to, but it does happen. It does happen, and it's, it's kind of hard to know. I mean, I think it has a lot to do with the time of the year because it doesn't happen all the time. 
Uh, but I think you need to be vigilant. Our philosophy on it is, or my philosophy, and I haven't heard anybody else say this, but if pigs are in the wild, they're going to be bred the very first gestation. They're not going to say, oh, we better wait till she's a year old. No, no. Bred on the very first gestation. And I think that's the design. Um, when they are bred on the first gestation, be fertilized. And so if she has only four piglets, her trance time when she goes into um, into labor, they go into a trance sort of, and you don't see it right off. Uh, if someone didn't point it out to you, you wouldn't even know it, but they're just not quite with it. And uh, it's, it's their way of just relaxing, laying over, and then they, a baby will come out and sometimes they'll get up and they'll kind of go around in circles and stuff, but then they'll lay back down and they're, they're not so out of it that they lay on their own babies. Hopefully sometimes they do, but most times they don't. And, uh, if they're a, uh, a first time mom and let's say that they're 13 months old, which is what I hear a lot of recommendation. Oh, they got to be 13 months old. No, that's from the, that comes out of the universities where they're trying to, um, get guys that do gestation crates and farrowing crates to get maximum piggery out of it. And that's not what we're doing in the homesteading business. If I have a sow, I want her to be a good solid sow that, uh, that understands the program. And if she understands the program, I want to keep her around for a while, you know, without a doubt, I want her around for a while. In the uh, factory hog business, they only keep them for X amount of farrowings. And it's, it's not many, like four or five. And then they're gone. With us, no, it'll be longer than that, a whole lot longer than that. We can, uh, most times, I mean, you definitely have the option as the farmer or uh, if you have a sow and you don't want to let her farrow again for one reason or another, if she's not being a good mom or she's temperamental or she's got other problems, you may decide to uh, send her to slaughter. And that's your prerogative. But um, a, a lot of uh, homesteaders and myself included, I like to keep sows for a while, you know, because they they get used to it and they get good at it. And you you. You don't want to, uh, I, I think we were talking about this the other night. Um, like my older cows know the routine. And so they teach the younger cows. Oh, here's where we go to eat grass. Uh, we got to go back to the barn for water. Oh, let's go back to the barn because it's safe up there at night. And then the younger ones go with them. We don't want everybody doing their own program. So uh, Animals uh, gain experience, and you want to use that to your advantage. <clears throat> yeah, we've got a barking dog out there. So I like to have them farrow the first time, and they have a smaller number of babies. But it doesn't send them into um, hysterics with, you know, 15 babies running all over them and and they don't know what it is because it's their first time. So I think the first time, first or second time that they just ate, is a good time to breed them, in my opinion. I've not heard anybody else say that. But that's a good way to kind of build a solid sow. That's how it would work in the wild. Okay. Um. I'll give, him, give you this one because it's related. Cody asked, how many chances do you give a sow to get with the program? Um, I, I'm thinking here because it depends how high speed your operation is. 
Um, if I had 30 sows here, I'm watching them and they make one mistake and I'm calling them out and replacing them because I'm trying to get the most efficient herd that I can. But if I, like now I have six sows, I'll give them a chance. You know, what do I have to lose? I got a good feed source. Um, if, if I give them a chance and they, they flub it another time, am I losing anything? No, uh, unless they're breaking out and coming in the house and murdering people. No, I'm not losing anything. Um, let's say that they're not good moms and they start to destroy their own, which I just had a sow that did that. And I, I think I talked you guys all through that. Um, and that's where we stepped in and said, nope. And we took the babies and, you know, we still had a little bit of a learning curve. Uh, we had not taken a big group of babies from their mom before. I, I don't think we had, uh, we'd done it because of weather, but then we gave them back. But this time we took them and we were not going to give them back uh, because she killed one of them. She actually killed three of them. And then we lost three of them and we didn't know why. And we checked with a friend of ours and he says, Oh, you got to do this. And what, with what was happening was we were feeding them goat milk, <coughs> which is not their milk, but it's closer to what they can digest than cow's milk. They'll scour on cow's milk quick diarrhea, but their manure were, coming out and it looked like it looked like uh, white pellets coming out and they would they actually looked like rabbit pellets you know rabbit feed only they were white and they'd come out break off and fall so they were brittle and then when you'd pick them up they were just uh, like bone almost you know and uh, we had uh, two pigs that started getting a little lethargic and then the next day they were dead. And so we started calling around because they were all going to go that route. You could tell they were all kind of going that route. And what we had to do, nope, get out, get out. What we had to do was massage around their butthole and then put some oil on it to get them stimulated so they could expel those those pellets and they made two of them made it out of five but it was a learning process and two is better than none but the the mother i mean i got two two baby pigs out of her and then we processed her and we actually used her for a class and we've sold quite a bit of that meat and quite a bit of that meat is in our freezer so we didn't lose anything you know it it's uh it's one of those things uh, you can, as a homesteader or a small farmer, you can win when you lose if you have it set up right. Uh, so that was an ugly situation. She killed some of her babies, but I was able to salvage something out of it. And then she was the biggest uh, gain in, in our operation. She was, she was actually quite a game, you know, that's the nice thing about having a butcher shop or, or processing area or having that, the ability to be able to process your own animals is, uh, your sow can be with you for five years and you can get in, in, let's say you're going to, let's say you're going to get, uh, average size litters. Let's just say eight times two a year. So it'd be 16 times five. But if you kept her around for five years, what would that be about? Five times 16. I'm sorry. I don't have a calculator on my phone. 80. 80. So 80 pigs in five years, 80 baby pigs. Let's say you sold all those 80 baby pigs for a hundred bucks. So you get, 80, and then you put two more zeros on it, $8,000 in five years just on wiener pigs. 
sell them for a hundred bucks a piece. And you can sell them all day long for a hundred bucks a piece. Mangalitsa anyway. And that's in five years. And then at the end of five years, you turn her into sausage and you can get 750 a pound for that. And in five years, you're probably going to get 400 pounds of sausage out of her. So you're not losing. You're definitely not losing. Farming is not a losing proposition. It is if you allow yourself to do stupid things like ship your animals and then allow them to tell you what they're going to pay. Then you're stupid. You, you, you milk cows for four or five days, ship all that milk, and the co-op sends you a check for what they think it's worth. Here's what we can pay. Are you kidding me? Would you do that if you were building bumpers for GM? No, you'd nail down the price first. But farmers do stupid things. And that's why they say there ain't no money in farming. But farmers like farming, and so they continue to do stuff like that. Uh, raise up animals, beautiful, beautiful animals, and then take them to the sale. And then you're going to have some auctioneer that's going to be trying to get what he can for him, but all the buyers are kind of in on it, and they're not going to pay any more than, you know, a little bit over, I don't know, Chicago meat prices. That's crazy. That's that's You just don't even want to get involved with that. You want, as a homestead, you want a solid group of patrons that you raise animals for, you slaughter them, and you provide that meat to those patrons. This is what it costs. Same like milking cows. We milk cows. We sell the milk for $8 a gallon. If people want to pay it, they can come up the driveway. If they don't, get it from the store if you want to drink dishwater. But, you know, there is money in farming. Definitely. But you just have to work things a little bit smarter. Um, you're never going to compete with Walmart prices. Never, never, ever. And as soon as you have people that say, ooh, pastured poultry, I really like it. But, hey, I can get chicken at Walmart for 15 cents, for 59 cents a pound. Then you, as the farm that's providing this and, and creating these products, you draw a line with a black pen through their name. <laughs> You can't have it because if they don't understand what you're creating, I'm, I'm listening to the glass pack on my, on my son's buddy's truck. If they don't understand what you're creating, then you don't want them for a patron. You want people that understand the, 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 effort that you go through as a small farmer to create pastured poultry or to create grass-fed beef or cr to create pastured pork, right? Because if, if, they, if they're okay with the stuff that comes out of CAFOs and the gross, irresponsible, and dangerous methods that they use in factory farming, if you're okay with that, then stay with that. Stay with that. But if you want clean food, it's going to actually nourish your body, actually nourish your body. I mean, it's a big difference. It's a, it's a huge difference. If, if you see bodies that are malnourished, but fat, that's a problem. And it's a real problem. And it's not just because they're eating too much. It's just because the body is saying, hey, what do I do with this? You put it in your mouth, chew it up. What do I do with this? I'll store it for later. He's probably going to eat more. And he does because you're never satisfied. That's the, that's the thing. So uh, there's plenty of people out there that want clean food. There's actually people uh, that need clean food that all of a sudden they start to have a problem that's a life-threatening problem. And then they find out that, oh, it's the food I've been eating. And they recommend that I don't eat that anymore. Where do I find food that doesn't have, you know, all these chemicals in it? Well, you're going to have to find a small farm. And by the time it goes to, gets to that point, People are saying, oh, uh, Pastor Paul, four bucks a pound. No problem. No problem. But before, when they're healthy, relatively healthy, they'll say, I'll go with 59 cents. You know, I can, that way I can eat more, you know. 
No good. No good. And this is real, too. This isn't just like a marketing talk, you know. When I first started to hear about this, I thought, well, you know, you can kind of pass that on. And some people are going to really want to eat clean food. Uh, but we've seen it in our own lives. Uh, we've seen the, the changes that have happened in, you know, this this thing that wa that I walk around inside of. Uh, it definitely does better on better food, a whole lot better, you know, better sleep, better performance during the day, better performance during the night, better, you know, all around you, you just, you know, fingernails grow better, hair grows better, you know, stronger, more endurance, all that stuff. And, uh, we, what was that? Oh, that door just closed? Is that? Oh, there's, yeah, it's hard to see that. Uh, since we've been out, out of the service, we we just don't go to the doctor unless we have a broken leg or a, a gash that needs to be stitched. And even then anymore, it's just like, take care of it here. Or having right. a baby. Cody, Cody wondered how long do you keep a sow for them? You know, that... If she's a good girl, uh, usually the deciding factor is her size. Um, when she's too big for the boar or she gets so big that she's way more concerned with creature comforts than being a good mom. And that does happen when they, when they get five, six years old, you know, and they're really big. And then they don't fit in the, the porta huts anymore. Then it's time, you know, it's just time to rotate them out. You don't want to go out there and find a 500 pound sow that's just died of old age. Don't worry, they don't get tough with with age. Sows don't. Um, the only toughness issue that we've ever had was when we made the decision to castrate one of our boars. We did two of them actually, and. Uh, Actually, the vet did him, and uh, he doesn't do it the way I did it. He doesn't do a lot of them. He's a friend of mine, actually. But one of them died, and the other one, we ate him, and he, he was tough. So um, his pork chops would, were great big things, but they weren't really good. They tasted okay, but they were really, really tough. So we wound up grinding up and making sausage out of them. Anyway, I believe that's what we did. <clears throat> um, the thought is that older animals are going to be tough. Not necessarily true. The thought is that young animals will be, uh, you know, superb flavor. That's not true either. If you ever shoot a really young deer, it's kind of boring. Um, a calf, if you ever, for some, we did this, uh, a couple of times uh, we had calves that we did not need and they were Holsteins. And so we thought, well, let's try out a little, a little veal, you know, and you think veal's going to be really good because, oh, gee, veal, you know, but it's, it's boring. It's just doesn't taste like much. You got to make, like veal, uh, you got to use a lot of spices on it to make it taste like, like something, you know, veal is, is making lemonade out of lemons. Okay. In the, in the milk world, if you're a, uh, a commercial milk producer, commercial dairy, you have your brood cows and those are the cows that you're milking and in order for them to what they call freshen, they have to have a calf and they want, they usually have them have a calf every year. Right. And it used to be that, you know, they put them in with a bull and you're either going to get a heifer or a bull, a male or a female. If you get a heifer, a female, Oh, that's valuable. We'll keep her and we will, um, raise her up to be a cow and we can milk her. It's going to take a while, but we can do that. And so she was valuable, but the bulls 
were almost of no value. I, I mean, literally of no value. Uh, it was there was a time, and there has been a time here recently where they, you know, they didn't advertise it, but they would just knock them in the head and put them in the compost pile. It's terrible, just horrible uh, practice. I'm glad I never had to do anything like that. <clears throat> but then they would go a little bit to to get some value out of them. They would put them in what they call veal barns and <clears throat> they feed them a milk replacer and they get them up to i don't know how big do they get them five five hundred pounds maybe they're not very big for a cow um, maybe not that maybe 250 and then they slaughter them and then some people want veal and there's certain things that they make veal cutlets and all this stuff we used to have those it was like five things you could have when you're in the Air Force and you went to like a retirement ceremony or something else. Veal cutlet was always one of them. And it was just this breaded chunk of meat. And it was veal. and But it was so breaded, it was sort of like eating Kentucky Fried Chicken. Is this chicken? I don't know. It tastes good. You know, it's got a lot of salt and sugar in it. So that must be good. Um, but I think that's probably where all the veal goes goes to the Air Force for retirement ceremonies, right? But it's really not good. It, you know, you'd think young animals are good, but they're really not. The best beef you'll ever have is about a four-year-old cow. And a cow being that she's had, <clears throat> she's four years old, and she's probably had three calves. That's the best beef you'll have on grass. Next question. When should I start upping feed for a gilt getting ready to farrow? I know. I don't know. She should be getting up it from what? You know, she should be getting about five pounds of dry matter a day, five pounds of feed a day, you know, in order to create her calf. I mean, to create her, her uh, weanlings, Would you like her babies. Get a clarification. Out of oh, okay. Um, because he just asked if I had it. Upping feed on guilt expecting or wait until they're feeding the babies. Well, their feed. I, you know, think about it like this. I mean, I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to put it to you this way. When they're, before they farrow, they're building little bodies inside of them, right? So they need, more feed to do that and with with your sows you want to give them enough you want to give them enough you don't want them uh you don't want them hungry you don't want them what what would happen if you gave them too little they'd start to draw down their own fat supply which is not necessarily a bad thing that's why they have that fat supply it's an accumulation of calories that they can use when they need it like in the winter time they're going to use more um, but you want that fat supply to be at a reasonable level, a reasonable level. I mean, if they're just a big fat chunk, big fat blob, that's not good because they'll lay on their babies. You want them, you want them fit. All right. If they're real, real fat, I mean, it's just like a person. If you're real, real fat, you're not going to have good health. You're, you're working way too hard just to carry all that stuff around. And uh, if you accumulate too much, you you can't expend it. What will you use it for? Um, with a sow, she needs a reasonable amount of stores. And then when she farrows, she's going to turn a lot of that fat into milk for her babies. So, you know, it needs to be a reasonable amount. But I don't think that as soon as she farrows, you want to put her on a different feed. I, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's the way it should work. I mean, in uh, a farrowing situation, in a you know a CAFO situation, concentrated animal feeding operation, where all the animals are in, do you know what gestation crates are? Gestation crate is a a cage that is about six feet long and about two feet wide or maybe 30 inches wide. 
you can get in from the back and on the front of it, there's a trough and a nipple, a water nipple, a bite valve, they call it. And the sow is put in there before she's going to be bred. She's put in there. And then they'll walk the feed to her so that and flush to, to flush her. So she'll drop a whole bunch of eggs. But she's in there for they spend their entire lives in a crate like that. And then when she's about to farrow, she's about to have babies, they will move her into a farrowing crate. And a farrowing crate usually is a two position area. So uh, a gestation crate is a single position. You know, one pig, next position, another pig, next position, another pig. So it's just a, a battery of these six feet long, 30 inches wide, and the sow can get in there. She can stand up. She can lay down. That's it. She can, she can move forward. You know, if she's five feet long, she can move forward a, a foot and she can back up a little bit. But she can't, she can't turn around. Um it's bad. It's, it's really ugly and really stinky. And, um, usually they have these houses that have a thousand of them in it like that. And they're, you know, if you see pictures of it and videos of it, it's really gross. They turn the lights out at night. And, I mean, it's, it's just really bad. You can imagine just the smell and everything and they have to live in that. And then they're moved out of that into farrowing crates, which would be two positions they're in one position, and then next to them is where their babies can go. So the sow in a farrowing crate, she can kind of lay over on her side. Not very well. It takes them a while to get there. And then the babies come out her backside, and they move around onto a heat pad. And she feeds them <clears throat> for like a day or maybe two. And then... They take the babies away and move her out right back into a gestation crate. And in four days after she farrows, they inseminate her again. So they just, that's, they're just little piglet machines. And it's, it's horrible. I mean, they just, they never get to have the sun on their back. They never get to go outside. They never get to watch Oprah. I mean, it's just, it's just a tough life. And, uh, and then they're turned into, Spam. Or Jimmy Dean's pork sausage. You know, that's that's the way it is. I don't I don't remember how I got on that subject. <clears throat> oh no. So recommend five pounds dry matter to sow and boar for maintenance? Boar can be less. He can be less. He's typically gonna have less supplies on him. If you look at them, they are just leaner. And they seem to, that's just the way they, they are. Even in the wild, they're going to be leaner and taller. And uh, they're, you know, it's sort of like the human world too. I mean, it's, the males are generally leaner. Uh, the female body has more capacity for storage for its function, in my opinion. Uh, some people wouldn't like that, but that's just the way it is. Wow, right. 69 minutes. Yeah, next one? Yeah. Have you used dairy from your cattle as a protein supplement for pigs? Oh, yeah. So, how much? Oh, yeah. I did it the other day. Because we milked Moon for the first time, and the milk was orange. It was so rich. Had so much fat in it. Um and colostrum too. I think it was at two and a half days after she calved. And it was kind of musky. You know, I had a glass of it. It was a little on the musky side. It was okay. Uh, but we didn't use that much of it in the house. And we needed to milk the next day. And we really didn't have the, the jar space. So we had think three gallons of that milk and I had to do something with it. So I got a bunch of little pigs here. So I gave it to them and they can always use it. Um, with 
like day old pigs, uh, two, three, a week old pigs, you have to be a little careful if you're going to give it to them day in and day out, you know, as a supplement for their mom with milk cows, uh, with, with cow's milk, because they will uh, scour and it can kill them. Um, so you have to be really careful. But just one shot like that, I think these two little pigs that I had are probably, they're a month old, aren't they? So it's not going to hurt them. Yeah. They're just kind of just ready. You, you've, you've never seen anything like it. Um, we have in their pen um, a dish that is probably this deep. It's one of those rubber dishes that are indestructible, it, like made out of tire, old tires, ground up tires, and then they reform them. Indestructible. Uh, then you turn it over and smash it with rocks and the ice comes out and you can't hurt the thing. But I put that in their pen and then I faked them out and moved them to another corner and then and dumped five gallons of milk in there. And they are all fighting because they don't want the guy next to them to get the milk. So they're fighting the guy next to them to get his ration of the milk. And so they wind up going around in a swirl and it's uh it's something to see it happened so quick i didn't get a chance to get a a video of it but uh yeah so they they took care of it and uh they do well with it if you ever have a milk cooler or something like that that goes down uh, uh and we've had this happen you, you can give them milk every day it's not going to hurt them um, with the exception of very young pigs that you've taken away for their mom and your bottle feeding them and the, it will hurt them. You could do it once or twice, but if you are giving them cow's milk continuously, they will scour. And if they scour too much, they will die. We've had that happen too. All right. Um, as long as you're talking about milk and calves, uh, Jesse also wanted to know, how are you dealing with the calf? Do you completely separate from the mother cow? Mm, good question. Um, what, what we're doing is um, my cows are getting nothing but grass right now, and they're not going to get anything but grass until... December is, is what I'm shooting for. That's what I shot for last year. And I didn't quite make it because we get real wet um, in November. And I had to pull them in and start hanging them. So the cows go out and they get a different spot to eat every day. Or I'll give them a little bit more of the field every day, every two days, maybe even every, every three days, depending on how the growth of grass is. So uh, Moon had her calf out on the field last Thursday night. Um, the first milking we did of Moon, so it was, let's see, it was Friday, Saturday. It was Sunday afternoon, which turns out was a day late. We probably should have milked her Saturday afternoon. Um, she was up in the barn, uh, which she – she travels with the other cows. Um, and so she was at the barn and uh, we pulled her into the thing and we, and we milked her and then turned her loose. Well, she goes back out with her calf and then the calf sucks. So what we're doing is we're, we're sharing with moon. The calf is getting whatever the calf needs and we're getting the rest. So like today we got three and a half gallons and so I reckon that the calf got a gallon and a half. I think that's right, right about where she'd be. That's what I'm thinking. And we'll let this go on for a while. Um, at some point, we have to make a decision, and then the calf is taken away, and the calf can go on replacer, or the calf can get any milk that doesn't go out to a customer. So let's say the, the milk gets a little bit old. Let's say it gets four or five days old. 
give it to the calf. And it seems to work out pretty good. And then if we have to, um, see, because milk replacer is a lot cheaper than what you get for milk, you know, for human consumption. So it can make sense for us to go and buy a bag of milk replacer and you just put a couple scoops in a bottle, you shake it up with some warm water, take it out there and the calf will just suck it right down. And the calf will kind of forget all about mom and he'll start focusing on us when we're walking around and a couple times a day, you know, he's getting fed by us. We usually feed him twice a day. But right now we're just sharing with the calf and we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. We were expecting three of our cows to, to Pharaoh or to calf. And right now only moon and they were all inseminated on the same day. So not really sure what's going on. Got to just take it as it comes. Now that's another story right there. One of our cows, we don't really like her. She's not very nice. She always plays games with you. She doesn't, she doesn't trust us. Uh, and we don't want to let her get too old. And we've got replacements coming up behind her that are really nice. They're really nice, nice personality. They're going to be easy to handle. So this cow, I could pawn her off on somebody else for 750 bucks, or I can turn her into hamburger and the hamburger's worth, what's that worth a pound? Uh, six to seven. Six to seven a pound. Nine if you're in the right market right now. Yeah. So not going to lose anything on her and I don't really like her very much, so uh, I'm sure I'll like her between a bun. <laughs> and and that's that's a whole whole nother story. When we talk about processing cows, beef cows, uh, and dairy cows, um, would I process her and make ribeyes out of her? No, I wouldn't. And I certainly wouldn't do it this time of the year anyway. Um, she's a, a Jersey. So she's not going to make really good ribeyes. She, she's just not going to, she, she's not designed for that. She wasn't bred for that, but she'll make really good hamburger. And I don't need to hang it for any length of time because if you're going to grind it, it's sort of a mechanical, uh, mechanical uh, tenderizing method is what that is. And the flavor will still be outstanding. So there you go. Not going to lose any money on her. That's for sure. Um, Brittany wanted to know how many sows do you keep off each litter or how do you decide when it's time to keep a few sows? Well, right now I'm keeping some sows because uh, with, I, like, I don't know if it's because I'm telling you guys, hey, you need to prepare, or people are saying, hey, I better prepare, because they're just looking around. If you have some sort of sustainable thing going on your on your farm, and what I mean by that is, you know, you can raise a couple pigs, you go buy some wieners off somebody, and you raise them, but if you're, if you have sows, and you're producing piglets, you can you can sell those piglets for dollars and you can take those dollars and you can get other stuff with that. Or you can trade those piglets for somebody that does hamburger or somebody that does bees or somebody that does this or that or the other thing. Uh, that's a sustainable deal. And uh, right now I'm keeping more sows on because more people want baby pigs. So that's why I'm, I'm keeping these animals that are breedable and I want, I offered them to the public to come in and get some breeding stock so you can get going on this. Um, if the public doesn't take me up on them, then I'm going to keep them 
I can pharaoh them and I'll, you know, I'll make the gains on it. If the public doesn't want to do it that I've offered them to them, then I'll do it myself. You know, um, I'm not offering you something that I wouldn't do myself or, or why would I offer it to you? If I wouldn't want it, then I wouldn't offer it because it's, I couldn't very well look you in the face and say, Hey, this is a good thing, but it's such a good thing that if, uh, if they don't sell, then I'll just pharaoh them myself. Easy. Um, people don't like to make the commitment to keep breedable animals because they believe that it is is so difficult. It, it's just not true. Uh, Brittany, you know. Of course, yeah, Brittany, you, you guys had a rough go this winter. Yeah? <laughs> well... Chalk that up to uh, experience. But now you've, I've been stalking you. Of course, you put stuff up on, on uh, a page that we manage. So it's not, I don't think it's stalking. But now you've got a little pig that is like, like housebroken. And so you're not going to have any problem with her when she's farrowing. If you want to get in there and rub her belly, you won't have a problem with her. <clears throat> the problem that you will have with her, though, is if you need to get in a pen and you need to fix something, she's going to come over and just be all over you, mauling you. <coughs> That's why I don't like to get too friendly with my pigs. She said that she talked to a few people on trading pigs for beef. She wants to keep a good amount of females to make money, but John's happy with four sows. Oh, four sows is a lot of sows. That's a lot of... That's a lot of baby pigs. Uh, what did we say? In five years, 80 times four, 320. That's five years. Break that down to per year. Um, of course, you know, a perfect world is eight sows every time. It, uh, in in the, the homesteading world, is, is far different than the, um, the CAFO world. <clears throat> and you might think that, you know, if you jammed your sow into a farrowing crate, that your production would go up. That's not necessarily true. Um, you get her in a farrowing crate and then her, her frustration level goes way up and all kinds of things can happen then. And you keep her jammed up in a barn, no, no exercise, no sunlight. Oh, what happens then? You know, that's that's not a good situation. Oh, we'll just walk the, you know, the antibiotics to her and then she'll be fine. Oh, really? You know, you don't want to go that route, in, in my opinion. And Jill and I know because we actually did it when we were in Montana. I got talked into it by a guy whose folks did it and did it for years. And uh, then they're farrowing uh, place burnt down and the dad had passed away and uh, I bought everything from them and I set it up in my barn and it had like six positions that we could walk sows into and we had some luck you know but not like you'd think you'd think if you have them in and you can totally control everything then everything will be fine oh no that's not the way it works, you know. We had heat lights back then in the barn, and if that sow could get her face on one of those, she would grab it and tear it out. And no, we uh, little pigs fell through cracks into the yeah, car. yeah. I mean, it, it was and it stunk. You know, you had to clean manure all the time. I don't, I don't clean any pig manure up. I, I don't touch pig manure. I, I really don't. I don't even hardly step on it. My pigs are out on a field. They're eating that field and they're manuring in that field. And when they farrow in that field, I may notice, I may not. I may look at a bunch of pigs that are just been born and say, gee, I wonder when they were born. They sure look like about three days old, but I would not know. Um, and they're out on a field like that. There's very little interaction between me and them. If you have them in a barn, 
you got to be checking on them all the time. You can't just leave them, you know, locked up in the barn. It's sort of like keeping prisoners. You got to be checking on them all the time because they'll they'll get into stuff. They'll they'll figure out a way to do things that um, you you just wouldn't imagine. You know, things happen. So it's always, in my opinion, it's better to mimic nature and allow them to take care of themselves and um, that's what's worked best for us we're, we're really long on time yeah How many... i've got one more question okay one more i'll take it um okay cody is concerned with knowing when to feed uh when to up feed a sow when he's running the barn sow together um is knowing when the sow is pregnant because he doesn't want to overfeed uh, some people say you can't know until she bags up and it's time to farrow. Yeah, don't don't worry about overfeeding her. Um, she's just going to get a little fat. That's all. Uh, don't worry about that. Um, worry about underfeeding. So if you go out there and there is there is no feed, um, then oh, you might have underfed a little bit. <clears throat> but if you did, no big deal. You know, you'll you'll make up for it. Uh, don't look at it as though <clears throat> it's a make or break deal. There's a lot of forgiveness when you're when you're mimicking nature like this. <clears throat> Whole lot of forgiveness. Uh, I had a situation just recently. Uh, you know, I have a I have a bread dispo- disposal contract. And uh, <clears throat> I get way more bread than I can deal with. And so I have to line other guys up to come and get it. And sometimes it can be a real hassle because, um, you know, I'll say, hey, there's a load of bread here. Are you, you going to come get it? And they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll be there. And then two, three days go by and that bread's getting kind of ugly. And then, oh, I don't want it now. So then I have to deal with it. What do you do with it? You know, so. It, I have to manage it, but I had a situation happen not too long ago where all of a sudden the guy came and he took all of it and I didn't have any. Well, um, I had fed in the morning, but in the evening I just skipped it. And I just thought, well, you guys can just be a little bit hungry and you're going to be all right. It's nothing, you know, it's, it's like, uh, I haven't eaten dinner tonight, and it's nine o'clock, so I'm I'm a little late on it. No big deal, you know. They they'll be okay. If you were a little off on your feeding regimen, eh, no big deal. That's kind of the the nature of the homesteading model is it's forgiving, you know. It's forgiving. It's not a precise thing where if you're a you know a couple of calories off, oh no, no. Don't it's you don't want to play that game. Some of the sites that you go to or some of the Facebook pages where people are raising one breed of pig or another, um, it's kind of funny. They want to be the smartest person in the room. You want to be the smartest person and get stroked by uh, one of the monitors on there. And so they're striving to be the smartest person. And so they'll break it down to like caloric count. And I'm sorry, it's just. When you're dealing with life, it's just not that precise. You know, this is not brain surgery. At least that's, and I've been doing this a long time and we've had a relative uh, level of, of success. We've been pretty successful at it. And so I, I never want anything modeled so that if somebody makes a mistake, we lose the farm then. No, I didn't. Just not. I just don't do things that way. Um, and I don't, I don't think that's, you know, we're going to talk at some point, one of the themes that I want to talk about <clears throat> for me, well, what do you, you know, if somebody has asked me, well, what's the most important thing that you do on your farm? Raise my kids. That's what this is all about. Um, so my kids help a lot here and they're kids, 
I was earlier, I was cruising around and I saw one of the lines for the water was boop, just popped off and it was running. So I walked over there and there's one of my kids was responsible for making sure there's feed in there and there's water in there. And I went in there, there's no feet and there's no water. And did, did the chickens, uh, did they burn the barn down? No. Did they spray paint all? No, they didn't do that. They just like, Hey, we're hungry. But if it had been a couple of days, uh, then we might have had some problems, but it wasn't a couple of days. It was maybe a day, maybe two without feed. Uh, but, you know, there's grass and stuff around, so they're not going to starve. And there was still a bunch of eggs. So it, that happens. Those things happen. And you're going to have mistakes and hopefully you can kind of narrow those things down so they don't. All right. We're at the end. We're over 80 minutes. We're over 90 minutes. Okay. We're going to pick it up tomorrow. Uh, We're going to be talking about animals on the homestead. Um, I got a couple of interesting topics, but hopefully we can, uh, we can field some questions on some things. I'm going to go for now. Good night. Thanks for coming by. Remember, anyone can farm.